Today I want to share with you something that has to do with creating a field which I hope to explore a week after next when we talk about social, uh, when we talk about transpersonal sociology. Because when I start asking this question that always keeps coming up when you sit quiet, reflect, and you get to the place, what does the planet need? What kind of healing is necessary? How do we go about doing that? <clears throat> There's always a question of can we do more than what one individual can do? Is there a way in which we can do things together? You heard me use that phrase, the only way to get it together is together. <laughs> so that's nice, but how do we do our togethering? So imagine now that if our body cells would not talk to one another, could you imagine how sick we would be? And it turns out that the organs, if I take nations to be organs of the planet, they don't talk well to each other. It is as if half of the world sees the other half of the world as a threat to their immune system. <laughs> and so when I think of um, the Islamic world, which right now is feeling um, the pressure of how we take Islamicists and compare that to all of Islam, how this isn't quite the way in which we should be doing it. And how do we proceed when we need to deal with larger groups and how do we proceed when we begin with individuals who want to share with each other? And every time when you ask people what is it that you do for your spiritual work, the answer that they give is, oh, they come up with such wonderful things. Qigong, you know, Tai Chi, yoga, meditation, chanting, breathing, and then you ask, that's wonderful, how often do you do it? Well, you see, I can't afford all the time, I need to be able to do something with my, give quality time to people that are important to me, so I haven't got all the time that I, to spend on my spiritual practice. Good. Tell me, how much quality time do you spend with your people? <laughs> and then they start saying, well, I'm not together enough. <laughs> and you get to see the difficulty that we have because most of the spiritual paths that are available to us <clears throat> cut us off from sharing with one another because when you see the attitude that we do, the mudras we do, we sit down, close our eyes, get tight ass on the chair, you know, <laughs> and now I'm doing it for real. <laughs> and with that attitude, we cut ourselves off from the other people who are near and dear to us because not necessarily do we include them. Even if we sit with them together, it isn't the same. Now, it's also true that if you sit with a large group of people and you do that solipsistic, I want to call it, meditation, the one that's all together inside of you, it's also not bad because it creates an atmosphere, it creates a field which is an important field. But it isn't enough. And especially if we would like to reinforce in our way of doing something steadily so that we can say this is our practice and this is how we share our practice with people who we care for, how would we go about doing that? I'll let this dangle for a while because I want to review a little bit of history with you.
Social structures at one time were governed like a pyramid. You had people who were sitting on top, as it were, the emperor, the king, the high priest, and then there were layers and layers and layers of people down below. And the understanding was that the people who are on top know better, and if they will tell you what to do, it's important that you should do it this way. And the one who knows best of them all is God himself, who then will mediate by revelation to prophets what has to be told. And these prophets are going to pass on the word to other people. And the more literally we will take what has come down to us from above, the better we will be. In other words, we give up our autonomy to the one who knows better. And that notion is called heteronomy. Okay. Hetero, the other, nomos, calls the shots. It says what the law is. And from there we moved, <clears throat> at the time of the Renaissance, into this kind of humanism that is trying to grow the power of the individual person and the recognition of who is person, to the point that even now there are so many people who feel that from the moment of conception on, the fetus too is a person, and you have to deal with that. What this meant was that the social fabric that existed before, which had to do with nuclear family, extended family, clan, tribe, nation, all these things were chopped down, were broken, the, the social fibers that connect people were shortened. There was a time when worship was a very social thing because we didn't have that access ourselves that priests and prophets had, plus the fact that there were some special places, special temples. You could see today, even when you speak of Our Lady of Lima, of Our, Our Lady of whatever place you want, Guadalupe, that meant that particular place was a better place, a better chakra place, where you can contact, it was sort of a log-on place, you know? <laughs> and you see this even in the sense in which uh, Jews turn to Jerusalem, Muslims turn to Mecca, and there is that sense that if you want to direct your prayers, if all of them come together at that place, that is the togethering that's necessary, and it'll reach heaven. Priests, Levites, celebrants, singers, there was a whole thing. You couldn't just do it one person, you know. You had to have all the people who were involved in doing that. And whenever, for instance, a chant would be led by a cantor, by a Levite, by a priest who would say, and all the people would answer, for everlasting is kindness. And if you have seen how this goes in the Psalms, there were so many responsories. Or, and so it was that people would always be in a social field when they were doing their spiritual work. There were circumambulations. You walked around holy places, seven times around the Kaaba in Mecca when you go for the Hajj. In uh, Jerusalem, there was there's a time once a year that they go around the whole city and count its towers because so it is written in the Psalms. People would enter the church together or at least the celebrants would come in, everybody would rise, and there would be an introit making its way all the way to the front, and at times it would be with very high drama. And in front of the celebrant, someone would go swinging a censer, and there's that funny joke about Tallulah Bankhead and Cardinal Spellman. Cardinal Spellman said to 
Taluma, why don't you come? She said to him, why don't you take in my show sometime? He says, you come to my show, I come to your show. <laughs> she is in St. Patrick's the next Sunday, and he is making his way, and the organ is playing in there, walking in, and this whole procession is going, and the thoroughfare goes in front with a censer, and Cardinal Spellman uh, takes it away from him and swings it as he walks by and says, how do you like it? <laughs> and she says, your outfit is gorgeous, <laughs> but your purse is on fire. <laughs> so, uh, I'm telling you this because with that humor, you get a sense of what it's like when St. Patrick is filled and people are coming in and the organ is playing and so on and so forth. It's a big social event. Even when it came to home observances, you were dealing with something really special. You spoke about, and you still see this in some movies, that as people are trying to uh, get to the dinner, they're all waiting until Papa is going to say grace. There was a sense that you don't begin to eat until you've gotten the sign that you may begin to eat because Amen was said after the invocation, after the blessing over the food. When mother was lighting the candles, the same kind of situation <coughs> happened. People would be standing around. The other day I was talking to my granddaughter and she was telling me how my mother, let her, may she rest in peace, would know the names and the details about each one of her grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And uh, she asked me, how did, how did Bobby do that? And I said, because as she was lighting the candles every Friday night, she had a big shopping list for God. <laughs> and she would tell... Give them some idea of the numbers. Thank you. <laughs> I think there would be about 60 great-grandchildren there at the time when she was lighting candles. So it's a long, long list, okay? Now, there are certain kinds of furniture in a family. I once went to Goodwill Industries and I saw this gorgeous oaken pre-adieu. And I didn't want anyone to use it for making a lamp or something else. So I bought it. But I couldn't use it. A, it was a kneeler. And that's sort of anatomical apostasy for Jews. <laughs> uh, secondly, it had a cross on top, so I couldn't use that either. But I felt it was such a good piece. And so there was a family, they were Anglican. Uh, one parent was Quaker, the other one was Anglican, and so one day I brought it over to their house. First they had it in the living room, and then they didn't like it there, so they put it into a bedroom of one of the children. But then each one of the children wanted to use it, so it came back into the living room. The point I want to make is that every house needs to have a God's corner, you know? Because if you don't assign space, you will not assign time. And if you assign time and space, the likelihood is it will also become socially used. People will do something together in that place. Life cycle rituals. Somehow they can't be celebrated alone. You have to have other people. Even at birthday, you want other people to sing your happy birthday and make you a cake and something like that. Rituals demand group work. So, how would people prepare for these things? First of all, the vestments. So I was talking about the outfit that the cardinal was wearing. But I don't know if you have been to a sacristy inside a Roman Catholic church. At least before Vatican II. There you had things so clearly designated. Prayers were sort of inscribed on a table there that said, when you put on the alb, say this prayer. When you put on the surplus, you say this prayer. When you put on the cincture, you say this prayer. Each one of those garments that people put on 
had another prayer associated with it. We do the same thing when we put on the talit and the tone, we say a prayer. It is to say, I want to become the person who wearing these things will be different than the person who goes shopping. So I want to be able to do something. And so you will see that people will wear special clothes, Hasidim will wear their outfit, the shreimel and the kapote, you know, the fur hat and the silk coat. And so you will see that special occasions have special dress with them. Um, a Nobel Prize winner will have to go there with white tie and tails and the whole work, you know, because it is that kind of an occasion. So most of the time when we are doing prayer and the picture that we have of pioneering um, families going out west, we don't see them putting on anything special. That had much more to think, in your blue jeans you do your prayer and you know, and you don't wear anything special. Still, I recommend that if people have a little stole, a little something, especially a meditation blanket, how wonderful that is because it prepares you. How would it, in German you would say, Kleider machen Leute. Uh, garments make, turn you into a special kind of people. So as I was talking about these things before, we had heteronomy and we moved to autonomy with the uh, Renaissance. And then, the question came, what kind of things should you surround yourself when you set up a God's corner? And then people used to go to give me that old time religion, you know? There was a sense that that which has been proven throughout our experience, that people in the past have used these forms, whether it is a crucifix or a Shiviti picture or a Gohamsen if you are doing that kind of Buddhism. In each case, you want to have something that you can place yourself in front of, to be in the presence of. And the more that thing has been in use throughout history, the more that symbol has been loaded with the morphic field of people who have prayed before that, and so it is so much easier to enter into that uh, possibility. Besides the garments, people would prepare themselves, sometimes taking a ritual bath, going to mikveh, especially uh, washing hands in a special way, dipping fingers in holy water, lighting candles, lighting incense, all of which was to say, can we create a new ambiance in that space that we are about to enter? So these preparations have been helpful, whether you're doing it as an individual or if you're doing it socially with other people. <clears throat> Here in America, we have gotten to the thing that we don't, we get embarrassed by public display of piety. We sort of figure that ought to be quiet, you know. I'm not so sure what a big tumult is about moving the Ten Commandments out of the courthouse, you know. Sometimes I think people are leaning way over backward, and instead of paying attention to what they are saying, they talk about what meaning it has about church and state, you know? I think uh, if you pay attention uh, in a courthouse, what is it that you have to swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? It would be good to see that thou shalt not lie <laughs> before <the court. laughs> or bear false witness. <laughs> the problem is that if, for instance, it was noon and you were to find a Muslim in the street, prostrating himself and doing the prayers, you would be embarrassed by that. You would feel, why did they have to do that in public, you know? As if they were relieving themselves. <laughs> uh, that sense that we have, that people cannot show their souls anymore, that I think is what 
gives the quality of our social structure uh, a bad feel. So, furthermore, as I was talking about the thing before that you're doing private uh, things and you're doing them just inside of yourself, there is the other problem that most of the time when people are doing something, quote, religious, spiritual, they do it once a week. Imagine you would eat once a week. <laughs> Your soul needs maintenance. The soul needs food. What are you going to give it if you only do it once a week? And so we are coming back. How can I do this every, every day and have more time to do it? So many of us, here especially in Boulder, and those people who are the hyphenated ones, like Jubus and uh, Jupies and so on and so forth, <laughs> and are doing Catholic Zen and Christian yoga and so on and so forth, the, the, hy the, the, the hyphenated people have absorbed uh, something from the Far East imports, but these imports have been stripped of markers, of ethnic markers. And because of that, they are less potent. You know, if you want to take only one part of a plant remedy and distill it, you may not get the same help that you would get if you had the whole plant, because the whole plant has more stuff to it. So importing uh, rituals, importing things from the Far East without taking a lot of the way in which they celebrate them there makes it thin, makes it very poor. So now <clears throat> I go back and soon we're going to do some practice together. In 1975 was a tenth year in which um, Martin Buber, who has been teaching us about the I-Thou relationship, had died. And we met in Washington, D.C. And a number of us gave papers on what he had done for us, what teachings he had given to us, and how important these teachings were. But I had been through the whole business from tea groups and encounter stuff and so on and so forth. And I said, I don't want to give a paper. I want to do a lab in eye bowing. Because most of the time what happens is that people get a good idea. But from the idea into how to put it into practice, there is an abyss. They don't have the sense, how do I move from here to there, you know? People say uh, that the difference between the regular cookbook and a gypsy cookbook is that the regular cookbook says you make an omelet, you take three eggs. The gypsy cookbook says you steal three eggs. <laughs> The point of that being, and I don't want to put things down on the Romani, you know, pretty soon people will say I'm insulting a minority. I don't mean to do that. I mean to show that when people tell you, do something, do this, do that, they've got to show you how. They've got to give you the wherewithal to be able to do it. And if you don't have the how-to, then it's not going to work. So I felt that what Buber was saying to us, you have to do the I bow thing encounter the other person fully, not as an object, not as a, um, as a some, someone you want to manipulate or do something with. How do you go about doing this? So we find out that people like to have a sense of intimacy. We starve if we don't have that. If we feel that constantly we are only on the periphery and no one has fully seen us, no one has ever encountered us, met us, we feel, we feel, how would I say, something is dead in us. It becomes, it comes to life when we bring this out and when we share an encounter with other people. It's true that if I go back to the 60s and 70s, the people who craved intimacy thought there was only one level in which you can get it, and that was genital intimacy. But there is emotional intimacy, which is a lot more important, and there's certainly spiritual intimacy that we're craving most. Who 
feels truly seen as a soul by other people who have been working on themselves and trying to help the world in some way. Most of us feel isolated and alone in this thing. And so my work has been to bring about people sh doing this kind of sharing. So now we're going to do something like that. I'm going to ask you to reflect, sit back, go inside of yourself, and ask just one question. How can I become more transparent to that light that gives life to me? Okay. How can I be more transparent to the life that gives life to me? Now turn to your neighbor and talk about it. It's better to do it in twos than in threes, okay? do something else with you. <laughs> At times, I ask people to take a sacred text. And <clears throat> the trouble that we have is that we read the text and we're so busy reading <laughs> and especially if we have to read it out loud, we are so busy reading, so we shouldn't make a mistake, you know. And we hardly ever take our eyes out of the book with a sacred text to play the video of what we just read. The whole point of getting to use sacred text is to bring him to life inside of us. So if we had more books around, I would ask you to share. But to imagine one of you has a book, and he is doing, or she is doing the audio, and the other one is doing the filio and the video. Okay? Filio. <laughs> so I'm going to read you a psalm. You may know that psalm. I'll read it slow, so that you would be able to get a feel inside of yourself, visualize things. So, because if you don't visualize them, it doesn't work, you know? If someone says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and they never get into the place of, oi, I want this, I want that. <laughs> but God will provide, so the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, it's okay, it's okay. You get the idea? You have to talk to yourself, you have to think of it. It won't work if you do it doesn't become it doesn't come alive. So I'll read you a song and listen to it. Close your eyes. Do your video. I'm gonna do it nice and slow. God, our master, how awesome is your glory all over earth. Such immense beauty you radiate from the heavens. Your strength is founded in the first speech of babes and toddlers. It can overcome all your vengeful foes. I'm awed when I see your skies, your handiwork, and fingerprints. The moon and the stars you have arranged. What are we who must die that you 
infinite cosmic one be mindful of us. What is a human being that you should take notice And yet, we are only a touch less than divine. You crowned us with awareness, with consciousness, with glorious splendor. You made us stewards of all that you designed. All of it, you have made our responsibility. Flocks, herds, all of them, as well as the animals of the wild. Birds of the sky, fish of the sea, Whales and dolphins who traject the oceans. God, our master. How splendid is your radiance in all this world. Amen. Now talk to your friend again. <laughs> uh, how, how did you do with the video? and you'd have your quality time. <laughs> so, here comes another <laughs> The other thing that's important, you know, uh, when I was talking with my partner here, the issue about transparency comes in. Ima imagine you're doing Vipassana, or you're doing any other kind of meditation. If you have a sense that you allow God to come in to your awareness, that you are not just closing off. And we did a little exercise together, looking into each other's eyes. And there comes that moment where you figure, uh-uh, I don't want to see what's downstairs. You know? <laughs> uh, that's when we shut down. That's when we become opaque and how important it is to stay open uh, for that. Because without that, there can't be that spiritual intimacy. I don't believe that we will be able to heal the planet without all becoming telepathic. All the candidates on each side of the aisle, play poker all the time. They say, I know something which I won't tell to anybody else. Look how many records are locked off from public scrutiny. And certainly their hearts are closed to other people reading them and knowing them. So it is very important that we prepare ourselves for global telepathy. Could you imagine in a, that 
the, the people who were thinking, let's say, of another attack in Iraq would feel the grief of those people who lost their lives today. I don't think they would plan another attack. It is only because they are thinking of the other people in terms of expendable objects in the way to what we want, you know? So the planet will not heal unless we get to global telepathy. And that will not come from thinking only what we thunk before, okay? So now you and your partner are going to do something that will be a true dialogue. And you will talk about the healing for the planet. And you will do it the following way. You'll start a sentence, in the middle of the sentence you'll stop and your partner will finish it. <laughs> <laughs> then your partner will start the sentence and you will finish it. Give an example? Okay. Eve, you and I are going to do that? Okay. You asked for it. <laughs> That's what the fish said if I get my mouth shut, you know? <laughs> I have it easy because I started with the thing with, with the opening. So you start with the opening instead. Also do something with <laughs> we can clean the waters of the planet if we are sure that we think of every body of water as something that we would drink. If we were to be able to watch what we spill out. <laughs> It would make us much more careful of what we took in. <laughs> Do you like what? a way that we are safe, that the other one will not be able to have an argument that we did it wrong, you know? And that doesn't at all apply to this kind of dialogue. There's a sentence that says in the Bible, one of the minor prophets says, then did those who respect God talk to one another. And God came and listened in, liked what they said and wrote it into the book that was entitled, Those Who Fear God and Honor His Name. The whole point is that such conversations go into the Akashic record, you know, and are what changes, if you will, the morphogenic field in which we are. Now I'd like you to put, when I say now, put things down on your chair, and face each other because for all the political hay that Bush and other people want to make by saying God bless America, I so wish that they would really get to feel the God to whom they're addressing that, you know? The, and the demands that that God makes for all, for the caring of all the resources of the planet for the caring for all other sentient beings on the planet, you know. But we are under-blessed. We're really under-blessed. And a blessing is like the sunshine and the rain that comes to a seed. We have a lot of capacities 
that hadn't yet begun to grow. There are some people who are concerned for health issues. There are some people who are concerned about relationship issues. People who are concerned about income issues. All of that. So look at your person whom you're going to face and let not your head but your heart come out with a blessing for that person and bless each other. And that's all you're going to do today and then you'll go home. <laughs> and you will feel very good when you go home and you will have a sense of the person you, you did this with, that you love them. And it's not a loving because you want something from them, but because you got something from them. So go ahead and do it. Now! <laughs> Ta-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-